So we've been talking about staph infections, talking about the patient, compliance, uh, washing, wrapping it up uh, with an activated charcoal poultice. One thing to realize is after you take off the activated charcoal poultice to clean it out again, it's going to look very dirty. People often freak out at this point because they look at their wound and it's now studded with black, right, with what looks like dirty black here. And uh, it's just the activated charcoal. It's not a problem. At this point, you also might want to do soaks again. If it's not getting better fast and you want to increase the effectiveness, you might want to soak the infection in some strong teas of anti-infective herbs. The two plants that I would suggest would be Chaparral, Larea species, and Yarrow, Achillea millifolium, uh, as, as uh, strong teas. So in other words, having those plants with you, gathering Chaparral if you live in the Southwest, or using Yarrow if you live in other places, and making really strong teas, and either making compresses of the tea and putting them on places, being really clean, about it so you're not spreading infection from place to place or soaking the body part in a basin uh, with those herbs. Something by the way we've done uh, at Rainbow Gatherings in particular where we have a lot of infections is that we sometimes actually use garbage bags and that's what the person soaks it in because we run out of basins and you can throw out the garbage bags. So sometimes we just buy a bunch of not heavy duty garbage bags and we fill those with the fluid. And let's say they have a foot injury they can actually just take the garbage bag we could put the strong washing the tea in there, the soaks, and then just have them hold it in that. Eventually, they'll get rid of uh, the water from that in a medical, we have a medical water waste place, in other words, dangerous water, and we put that in there, then they could just throw the bags out. So that's another way of dealing with, uh, without using basins, is just using plastic bags. They usually work pretty good, really. They, they're just a lot of disposability, but it's common in first aid. So you can also use soaking the infected wound uh, in berberine-rich herbs, like uh, Oregon grape root. I probably wouldn't use golden seal because you would need a lot of it. But if you have Oregon grape or, or yellow root, those would be two plants to also make really strong teas and soak the infection in as well. Don't soak it in comfrey. As for all the reasons I've mentioned previously, don't soak it in comfrey because you don't want a quick overlay of epithelial tissue that the bacteria can thrive in. A few other things about infections in general and staph infections in specific. Try to avoid powdered herbs in open wounds, like golden seal powder or even cayenne powder. When you put powder in an open wound, sometimes it's good in the sense of it's a disinfectant. The problem is the body has to extrude that powder in order to grow a new layer. Like it's a foreign substance. So if you had a wound here, even a road rash, and I put some powder in it, uh, it might help disinfect it, which is good, but until the powder is gone, the body's going to have a hard time regrowing skin. So better to take the powder, make a tea out of it, and strain it, or some other form where you can put a liquid in there that doesn't have, so that your body can absorb it, rather than it interfere with uh, skin healing. Sometimes you can use if, essential oils. Tea tree is a, a, a mild disinfectant, but not very harmful. Uh, lavender essential oil is a mild disinfectant. It's just, I mean, if that's what you have, uh, making a spray. So you would take the essential oil and add it to some water, and you can spray that in wounds. Uh, and it won't help speed the recovery for those two essential oils, but it could help keep down bacteria, uh, though they're not specific for staph bacteria. Propolis is another thing you might want to consider putting in infections. I talked about it initially. Uh, I don't tend to put it initially on a staph wound. I usually use activated charcoal. But after the activated charcoal, in between activated charcoal poultices, I sometimes use a variety of disinfectant herbs. And definitely, I sometimes use propolis, though it does stick to the wound. And it can stick the bandage to the wound, which can be messy, because then you have to add heat. You have to remove that bandage. And if you pull the bandage hard, it just hurts a lot. And it certainly impedes uh, skin mending, if that's already happening. You know that all these internal and external applications are working well. If the person is having less outbreaks of staph infections and their wounds are starting to heal. So we're going to cover specific herbs to take internally. We've covered a few and to use externally as anti-infectives. But the base course of this is that the person should be getting better, not worse. Even slowly better. The infections don't last as long. They're not as deep. It just seems like their body is on them and they're less grouchy. They don't have that staph grouchiness I often see. 
Uh, that means you're probably doing it the right way, but monitor, 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 right? It's still infectious. So what I want to talk now about is the treatment categories and then cover specific herbs in those categories. So some of the categories are anesthetics, and some of these were covered in pain, so I'm just going to ask you to review them from the pain uh, segments of this talk. Anti-infective herbs, and we'll cover, anti-infective herbs cover a wide variety, but often here there'll be specifically more antibacterial herbs, and uh, staph is a kind of bacteria, it sometimes will cover staph. Staph is a, just a very common bacteria that can be very resistant to being killed. We'll talk about we'll anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories are also covered in pain, but I'll mention any that are specific for inflammation due to infections. Astringent herbs, that's a category we haven't covered, but with wounds in general, uh, using astringent, anytime the skin is torn, you can almost always use an astringent. Uh, and the astringents, as we'll talk about a little bit, will help mend the tissue, which is really helpful here. They're not cell proliferants, though. They work on a different manner. Hemostatic herbs, also called styptics, herbs that help decrease bleeding. We'll talk about some of those. Pain remedies, they were mentioned. Uh, this person could be in a lot of pain, and actually trying to get those scabs off and changing and cleaning, uh, all those can be painful and traumatic, so trauma remedies. And then the last category, here are vulneraries. The word vulnerary means wound healing. It's the category of plants used, like comfrey and a few others, like calendula, that speed the recovery of injuries and wounds, uh, often from sprains and strains and also from breaks and tears and openings. So the first category are adsorbents, or things that help absorb any bacterial infection. The best is activated charcoal which I've just covered in some detail. But charcoal itself will work, but not as strongly, meaning you go to a fire, find those black pieces, crush them up, and you can put it on. But it's, it's mildly effective, so it's not that great there. It's just another idea if you're out of ideas. Powdered sterile clays. So if you buy your clays uh, in stores, you know, don't buy the fancy French green clays that are sold at face masks. Clays are absorbent. So if you go to like bulk sections and just find all the variety of reds and greens and browns clays, all of them do have some absorbent properties and can be used. But they're not, there's problems because when you put the clay on, since it doesn't make such a tight bond, you could start to have another infection go. So if you have staph, I wouldn't use any of these. But they are drawing agents for infections. And also just gauze pads themselves. You know, when you put some cotton, clean cotton on there and put it on tight right next to it, it's definitely going to draw some infectious material away, uh, but then they have to be cleaned regularly. The next category are anti-infective herbs. Anti-infective is a nonspecific category, uh, talking about a variety of plants that kill a variety of pathogens, a lot of them bacteria. So I want to focus on the plants that I consider you can use a lot of these in tincture or tea form uh, for a open cuts and wounds that get infected. Often it's staph, but no matter what it is, mo some of these will work really well. So some of them you know, yarrow is a famous one. So yarrow and tincture, yarrow and tea. Garlic is also used. I haven't had, garlic is famous for it. I mean, when you read Civil War remedies, uh, you read about soldiers making bandages and soaking them. And also in the bandages were things like sphagnum moss, right? They weren't uh, store-bought bandages, they were partially sterile plant material soaked in garlic. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what kind of garlic. So I'm suggesting that garlic can work, though I haven't had a lot of experience with garlic working uh, in open wounds. So it's something to experiment with, and there is lots of information out there. There's only so many plants that I've given a test to in my years of doing this. Uh, Oregon grape root and all the other berberine-containing herbs are really helpful. Golden seal, yellow root, gold thread, agarita, all of these are useful. Calendula uh, is not the strongest anti-infective, but if the wound is not too bad or the infection is not bad, golden calendula combines wound healing with an anti-infective quality. So calendula is great, really strong teas, not salves initially. No salves, no oils on infections initially. That oil traps in the bacteria, and if the medicine in the oil is not strong enough, 
you can have bacterial growth. In other words, you're setting up an environment for the bacteria to spread. Sometimes they do work, especially if the oils are really strong and have lots of yarrow and lots of golden seal and lots of calendula. But you have to be careful about putting oils and salves. Salves are just an oil with beeswax on top of an open wound um, if it's infected. If it's not infected, they're fantastic. Uh, myrrh, myrrh tincture is an excellent disinfectant to put directly in it, but it's got to be a tincture. Myrrh is not water soluble, so a myrrh tincture, just like you would put propolis, uh, is really helpful. Uh, echinacea externally as well as internally. Witch hazel, it's not the strongest disinfectant, and we'll talk a little bit more about it as an astringent, but you can make a witch hazel wash, and probably better to combine it with some stronger disinfectants as well, though, like Oregon grapefruit or calendula and uh, yarrow. Chaparral is useful, so another plant to consider is um, Larea growing in the southwest. I, I like chaparral a lot. It just kills a lot of microorganisms, and it's really safe for external use. It's a strong smell. There are internal uses for it as well, but chaparral is a favorite soak. After yarrow, chaparral is probably my favorite wound wash. OSHA kills a lot of bacteria. Propolis applied directly is really useful. You can't put propolis really in a wash, by the way. If you put propolis in a bucket of water, uh, the resins will just start to clump together. So propolis has to be used in an alcohol solution directly on. Um, and tea tree essential oil, uh, which is not very strong, but very safe. So those are some of the anti-infective herbs that I use. A lot of those are used externally, by the way. They're not so much at stimulating. If you're a person and you get staph infections easy, something to consider is taking herbs that stimulate immunity, and two really good ones would be astragalus and Ganoderma mushrooms, the reishi mushrooms. So if you, just, if you go into situations, you just get infections that heal slower and you get infected more easily, it's good to take an, uh, immune stimulating herbs and I would suggest those two in particular, Ganoderma and Astragalus. Next are anti-inflammatories. These are taken internally for this situation. Um, we've talked about a number of anti-inflammatories. The ones that I just want to promote here would be calendula, turmeric, and ginger and willow. So once again, calendula, turmeric, ginger, and willow are really good anti-inflammatories to help speed the recovery by reducing inflammation. The next group of herbs are astringents. So astringents, what they do, so astringents, it's important to understand their place in plants because you're going to want to extract them. One of the problems with being a plant is that you can't move under your own volition. If you're a plant, you can move with wind power, and the sun can kind of make you look up towards different directions with it. But plants just can't get up and go without a force like the wind or waves. The reason I'm saying that is that plants make protective chemicals in them. Many of the medicines that we use for ourselves from plants are also used by the plant to protect themselves. One major group of chemicals that plants use, woody plants particularly, use to protect themselves there's a group of chemicals, a lot of different kinds of these, astringents or tannins. And basically, the tannins in the plant help the woody plant tissue to restore itself. And what tannins do, so this is talking about tanning a hide, for instance. You're using astringents, and you can find out much more about astringents and tannins, which are really useful in a wide variety of circumstances uh, and other sources. Right now, what I just want to say is that when you use tannin-rich plants, like oak bark, for instance, what you're doing is, if you imagine the cells are loose in a wound. So you've injured something, your cells are not in a nice, tightly packed structure, they're looser. What tannins do is they draw the proteins of the cells closer together, forming a better bond. It's going to instigate your skin healing. At the same time, tannins are pretty good free radical scavengers. And there's usually a fair amount of oxidative damage done, a lot of damage locally, cellularly, to tissue into cells. So you have some free radical scavenging from them. That's by the reason that people talk so much about black tea as a free or green tea as a free radical scavenger. It's the tannins in the plant. They're called, in this case, those tannins are called polyphenols. But this group of chemicals are really helpful in restoring the tone of skin. 
after things like sunburns, I mean famously, just to put sunburns out, people say take a bath in tea. The reason you're taking a bath in tea is the free radical scavenging events, uh, excuse me, the free radical scavenging aspects to tannins if you take a bath in a really strong tea. By the way, you can get really caffeinated doing that, so you have to be careful doing that. Now, if you're going to do this, just so you know, first you take, the caffeine comes out fast, so what you do if you're going to make a bath, this is kind of off the subject, sorry, if you get a sunburn, you get those tea bags, you put them in some cold water and let them sit for a minute, take them out and pour that water off. That's very caffeinated water, or you can drink it, but you'll, you have a lot of caffeine if you have a lot of that. Then put them in hot water, and uh, cook them up a little bit, and then you get your tannins. So actually, right here I'm talking about, this is one way to make a tannic wash. It's just getting black tea bags, uh, or green tea bags, Camellia sinensis, the tea plant, and cooking it up. The astringents come out better cooked. So back to the plant. The tannins in the plant are used to help restore its uh, functionality, its structure. The reason I'm saying it is those tannins are fairly tightly bound in the cell structure of the plant. In order to get those tannins out, what you got to do is you got to apply heat for a while if you're going to make a tea. So if you're going to get something like oak bark or witch hazel bark and use it as an astringent wash, as a wash to help restore tone and bring those cells tighter together, uh, what you have to do is you have to boil them. It's that simple. So I'm just saying that I'm saying this as an idea of why the plant has it, these tannins are in it, they just don't float out easily. So if you strip a bunch of, let's say, witch hazel bark, what you do is cut them into smaller pieces, put them in a pot of water, and cook them at a pretty good boil for 10 minutes. They're pretty stable. So cook them for about 10 minutes, the astringents, and then you have a pretty good astringent wash for most of the plants I'm going to talk about. And the reason, again, you're using them is that tannins pull proteins together and they can help tone the structure of your tissue, thereby helping prevent infections. And actually, they also have mild antibacterial actions as well. So it's a pretty good deal. Lots of woody plants have astringents, by the way. Some of the main ones that I would suggest are woody and non-woody plants. First, a tip of the hat to Michael Moore. Uh, I, have a hat. I don't have my hat right here, but a tip of the hat to Michael Moore. Uh, who's, well, he's dead now, he died a little while back. Uh, Michael Moore is a well-known herbalist. Most of you probably have heard of him. Uh, I studied with him for two years in a row and taught botany at his school. And Michael, so this is a thanks uh, to all, I guess, everybody else who knows Michael um, and carries Michael with them as a teacher that incredibly influential in the best of ways for me. I mean, he was just a great thinker. So I question as a, somebody who's critical thinking, hey, Michael would say stuff and I think about it, but clearly his brain loved to capture disparate elements from different parts of herbal medicine and bring them together. He was just great at herbal theory. And I don't know why I'm bringing Michael up during astringents, but I like to appreciate, um, he was really important in my life as an herbalist. Also, he swore a lot while teaching. And as a swearing herbalist myself, it was really good to get permission giving from Michael Moore, the herbalist, to do it. And actually to just be irreverent and to come from a scientific model. Because a lot of the herb world, this is really far off topic, but a lot of the herb world has kind of the spiritual realm. I'm definitely more of the rationalistic scientific realm of herbal medicine. It always has beauty, right? I love plants. I'm an herbalist because I love plants. But it, definitely when I think about it, you know, I'm talking about polyphenols and astringents and drawing proteins together. And I think Michael Moore just really encouraged that set of beliefs in me and super important guy in my life. And his herb books are pretty much the funniest herb books. They have good information and they're funny. And obviously, if, if you're watching this, I just believe a sense of humor is really important, especially in first aid. Because if you're doing first aid, it's piss and shit and blood and pain every day and snot. You can't forget snot, right? And so it's just really, it's really good to, for me to have, you know, what people call gallows humor and be able to shrug it off. So back to astringents. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, students of Michael, for all of us learning and carrying it over. over. So oh, now I actually remember why everybody watching this is wondering when I was going to talk about Yarfa or Arfa. So Michael Moore liked to call the Rose family Arfa or Yarfa. Arfa stands for another rose family astringent. Yarfa is yet another rose family astringent. I'm going to write that on the board just so you can see the acronym for this. I'll just go with the Arfa. So another rose family astringent. Because the rose family 
Many of them don't have many toxic elements to them, but there are very many of them are astringent. So once you know your rose family, so roses, the rose shrubs, blackberries and raspberries, agrimony, many rose family plants can be used as astringents and they're safe astringents. When you're using medicine from a plant, it's not just what the plant that, when you're using a plant for medicine, you get something from it, but there may be things you don't want in it, right? So if you're going to soak your body in something that has a lot of caffeine and you absorb caffeine, that's detrimental. So when you're making medicine from plants, like an astringent, what you want is usually just astringency unless you're looking for specific other capabilities, but you don't want it to have poisonous attributes. So it's just when you're making the medicine from a plant, you want to make sure it has what you want and not things that you don't want, deleterious uh, materials. To, on to astringents. The first one is an arfa, and that's agrimony. Uh, agrimony is not an uncommon plant in the woods around here. So, um, so one of the many rose family astringents. Uh, uh, alchemia, or alchemilla, uh, when we did a tour around here, that's ladies' mantle. A ladies' mantle, believe it or not, is another rose family astringent, so you can use la ladies' mantle. It's not that common, but in my yard, maybe some of your other yards, it's pretty weedy. I can use a lot of ladies' mantle. I can gather as much as I need. The next one uh, is a Michael Moore famed one and one that I've really taken on and I think a lot of us. It smells good, it tastes good, it's strong, and that's Yerba Manza. Yerba Manza, the genus is Anamopsis, and the species usually used is Anamopsis californica. Yerba Manza Anamopsis californica is very specific for wounds because it's astringent with antimicrobial actions. So it combines killing stuff with helping tissues get drawn together. If you live around Yerba Manza, uh, I really suggest using it, getting those roots, finding where you can, you can ethically wildcraft it. Very useful plant, good in astringent, good, uh, excuse me, good in the tincture, good in the tea. So these are still astringents. Geranium root. Around here, we have geranium maculatum. I don't like to gather too much because it's so pretty, but actually it's very common. So the root of geranium, geranium maculatum root. Witch hazel, very common up in this area as well. And witch hazel, you, can, you know, it's the bark. Actually, most parts of witch hazel tree, except the heartwood, um, are pretty astringent. Witch hazel that you buy in stores is basically alcohol, with a smidgen of witch hazel. I don't really know what's in there, but it doesn't smell like witch hazel. It doesn't taste like witch hazel. Uh, it kills stuff because it has alcohol. But when I'm talking about witch hazel, I'm talking about you gathering witch hazel and making tinctures or teas with that witch hazel. And by witch hazel, I mean Hamamelis virginiana. Um, and uh, I tend to use the stem bark. That's one of the strongest parts of witch hazel. But the leaves also have astringency. It makes a great wash. You've got to cook it, though, or you've got to tincture the plant. If you're in the Southwest, another one of my favorite astringents is Cremaria. Uh, the common name for Cremaria is Ratany, R-H-A-T-A-N-Y. It's a beautiful plant. Uh, generally, it's put into its own family, the Cremariaceae. Is that right? Uh, Cremaria, that's it, sorry. Cremariaceae. Uh, it's, the only, it's the only genus I know in that plant. But a lot of people just put it into the P family, the Fabaceae. Whatever family Cremaria is, Ratni is the common name, Cremaria is the genus. There's a number of species. It's a really great astringent and a really beautiful plant. So that's a, another one. A few more, Potentia or Potentilla. Uh, they're very common rose family astringents. Oak, it's a favored. Oak is just a great astringent. You don't need to gather too much of any oak tree, but you need to get a branch. And you can just cook the whole thing up. Like, you don't have to take the bark off. I talked about this with willow. You could, if you're just going to make a wash from it and not make tincture medicines, you can take young branch, you can take branches off of it, cut it up, and just boil the heck out of it. Um, if you find branches that are already downed, that's even better, so you don't have to cut up an oak. But, you know, oak is pretty common. Just be, be good to the plants around you, whether it's oak or cremaria, which is et cetera. Rose shrubs work great. So if you're at home and if you're pruning your roses, prune a stem off your rose, chop it up, and cook it up. Or make, I wouldn't tincture it, I would just cook up the rose stems for the astringency. And then blackberry roots. 
So blackberry roots are really good astringent. Once again, all the same thing. So those are come, many of your astringents. They're going to fit mostly in this category, in this part of the class, which is astringents to help as for tightening wounds. Um, just a few more, and then we'll be finished with infections and wounds, which is a very common first aid problem, uh, is hemostats. I'm going to try not to spend the next four hours talking about how I haven't found any really good hemostats. When I talk about hemostats, people often tell me about yarrow and shepherd's purse and a couple other plants. I haven't had as good a result from them. It's actually held me back from even doing things like this. So instead, I'm just telling you that what I see happen is that people will say yarrow is a good hemostat, which means it helps stop bleeding. And they'll make a yarrow tea, and they'll take the tea, and they'll apply pressure on top of the wound, and then the wound will stop bleeding. I'm telling you that if you just get a glove on and the person is bleeding, if you put pressure on wounds, you often cause the veins to kind of curl up on themselves, torturous condition, uh, torturous something, that's what it's called, they curl up. Kind of if you ever cut a worm and you watch it curl up so it stops bleeding and, and can live. It's a little bit similar. You can imagine your veins as worms right now. So you don't bleed. If it's an arterial bleeding, totally different. Forget arterial bleedings for now. Venous bleeding, the most common kind of bleeding, if it's, it's not pulsing bleeding. Um, with veins bleeding, which is most of the time, the vast majority of time, uh, just putting pressure will help. So sometimes putting herbs on there will help, but I find that just the pressure by itself. The other thing, when you put a dried powder or dried material on top of a bleeding wound, it causes coagulation to occur quicker. So if you took yarrow and made a spit poultice, chewing it up and putting it on an open wound, it, it often will help stop the bleeding. But you can also try other plants for that. So I'm sure that yarrow must be a good hemostat. But I find that a lot of things, if you just put powders in when you put powder in there, basically, I don't know, I guess it, it activates platelet coagulation or something. When you put things on there, the blood kind of accumulates in a way, slows up a little bit sometimes, and then you'll start to, you know, form... Uh, platelet action where it just stops bleeding. Basically, the bleeding starts to starts to recede, starts to get lesser, starts to lessen. All the same ways of saying the same thing. So, but internally, you can sometimes use some of these herbs, but not so. I haven't found them that effective for open wound bleeding. One herb that does help for open wound bleeding. There's two things. First is cayenne pepper. So cayenne pepper starts a cascade of platelet action and sometimes will help stop the bleeding, but it can hurt. So what I've used, uh, there's probably a bunch of herbs that are strongly hemostatic that I will learn about with time. But the thing that I've come to rely on, unfortunately, is something I buy, and it's called Yunnan Paiao. Yunnan, as in the province in China, Paiao, which I forget what that means, a preparation, I think. Uh, it's better to take it internally. So it comes in a powder form. You could put that powder on externally on the wound. You could also just take the powder internally, and it just starts the whole coagulation process in our body in a safe way. And really, yun and payao really is the only thing I've seen uh, over and over again really help bad bleeding. I, bleeding. The reason you are bleeding is to get bacteria out of you, right? If you get a cut, bleeding is your body's way of moving stuff outward instead of inward. So initially, you don't have to stop bleeding. There's no, you know, if there's some blood coming out of you, it's fine. It's how we work. But if it keeps bleeding, then it's just unnecessary. And so you want to stop the bleeding. What I'm suggesting is Yunnan Paiao. You could put some powder externally, but you could just take the amount. It depends on if you buy them in capsules or uh, the little vacuoles. You can take them internally. And often it really helps. I don't know what's in it. It's one of those great states. It's like the Coca-Cola of China, right? It's the great state secret, except that it's not a private company, uh, this preparation for stopping bleeding. So I'm going to reiterate that. Lots of plants have been used to stop bleeding. I'm not so sure. I haven't had as much evidence because I tried different things. Pressure will help stop bleeding. Yanan Payao internally and sometimes externally will help stop bleeding. Cayenne pepper externally will sometimes help stop bleeding. So those are my favorite hemostats. I'll keep practicing. Uh, if you have lots of experience and uh, you want to tell me about it, you could, I'd be interested in knowing. But it's got to be really clear evidence for me. Uh, so I guess we would have to have some cut ourselves and apply these things and see when we stop bleeding. So those are hemostats. I hope that was mildly entertaining. Uh, 
there's two more categories. They are trauma aids. Trauma aids have already been covered under pain. So just regular trauma aids that people have cut themselves under a traumatic mode using those. And the last one are vulneraries. So the last category are vulneraries. I'm not going to get into vulneraries here because we're going to cover them in soft tissue injuries. And vulneraries have to do with restoring tone uh, to limbs, to connective tissue after usually you've injured yourself. So they're not specific really for infections uh, and for open cuts. So later on we'll talk about vulneraries, but it is one more application after you've injured a body part. So to recap some of this and discuss it, I just want to talk about some of the preparations you can use for infections. The first are tinctures. The beauty of using tinctures, so I've finished all the herbs, and now we're talking about the preparations of the herbs. One thing about tinctures is that alcohol is an antiseptic by itself. So when you apply a tincture to an open wound, the alcohol will also inhibit bacteria from growing. So that's the positive part of it. The negative part is that alcohol inhibits the tissue from regrowing. So alcohol will kill stuff, but if you keep putting tinctures on an open wound, and there's a lot of alcohol, the wound can't heal very easily. So it's just a consideration, right? Use tinctures, but at a point also just stop using tinctures to let the skin heal. So to sum up uh, about infections first, infections are very common often with staph bacteria, but there could be other microorganisms as well. So just be prepared for treating infections at these kinds of events. Uh, certain infections like staph infections can spread pretty quickly in a group of people if they come into contact with each other. Educate people what staph infections look like and how contagious they are. You know, so educate patients, educate other people who you're working with who might not know it. Know when to bring conventional medicine, modern medicines, into the scene, whether it's because the patient's compliance is low or the infection is just really bad. A couple of years ago, I was working with this man, uh, just very able, very strong, very vital, really staffy. He probably had 15 or 20 staff wounds. We were treating, treating, treating. He came in every day, very compliant. And after about four days, it was just clear that we weren't helping him. So we just asked him to, to, if he wanted to get antibiotics and helped him. I mean, that's part of it, helping him get to a place to get antibiotics. I don't know what happened with the antibiotics, but clearly everything we were doing wasn't helping. So it's just, it's one of many times, even with good compliance, right? It might be time to move on to the next step of strong medicines. Know, though, that herbal medicines can help with a lot of infections, particularly minor infections. Uh, find out if your patients are at risk because they have other diseases that might slow down the healing process. A classic one for that would be if they're HIV positive. Even if they're taking the drugs to control the HIV AIDS, uh, their immune system is not going to be up to snuff and you have to be really careful about infection spreading. But other kinds of diseases can also impede and make people immune compromised. And then for those, you have to figure out what to do separately. So I know very long-winded, um, and I hope you take something useful and practical from this, but that's treating infections in first aid circumstances. You just could be at home too, right? Everything applies to you or your friends or your children, your parents hurting themselves. And so thanks for bearing with me on this long-winded discussion on external infections. Thank mm -hmm. you.